Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I feel like I'm a longtime friend of Steve since we both started him here and me at Servants Church about the same time, nearly five years ago. Um, and my own friendship with uh, Central Reform goes far back before that, which we've talked about at other times. So in many ways, it feels like coming back home, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. This morning, our sermon is entitled, Two Transforming Truths. We're going to read about the resurrection of Jesus from John 20, and then talk about why it's so important. I hope that as we do that, it encourages your faith and strengthens your commitment to our Savior, Jesus Christ. But we have to acknowledge in the few minutes that we have here, we can only scratch the surface of such an important topic. And so here is a shameless advertisement that in the second hour, we will be taking some more time to look at uh, our faith in the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to look at how the Bible and early church history inform our faith. And we're going to look at some of the challenges to that belief and talk about why it's so important. And so now our gospel reading this morning is John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now John, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we come into your presence with joyful hearts. We thank you for the opportunity to offer you ourselves in worship. We pray that as we think and talk and meditate on your word, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our understandings, that you would so move our wills that, it would be, that our wills would become the same as yours, and that you would give us power to put into action those things that you teach us in this morning throughout every minute of our lives. We ask that in this time when we're looking at your word, that you would hold those cares of the past week and the concerns that we have for the week to come. May our hearts be solely devoted to you, that we may hear and understand all that you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday was Easter. If this church is like the one that I attended last week, there might have been two or three times more people than normal. This is the one day of the year more than any other on which we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even people who don't normally attend church often attend on Easter. Like church on Christmas, Easter is a day you don't want to miss. In this light, in our passage, Thomas had a problem. He missed church on Easter. On the most important Sunday in all of history, he was absent. Can you imagine what the other disciples said to him? Oh, you should have been there Sunday. It was a great service, the best ever. You should have picked another weekend to go to the lake, Thomas. 
We don't know where Thomas was or why he wasn't there. But we do know that throughout the week, the other disciples let him know about it. They t told him a lot about Jesus showing up and what he said and what he did when Jesus was with them. Thomas could not believe it. He did not accept it, and he boldly responded, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and unless I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. To his credit, a week later, he, was, he made sure to be there when the disciples again gathered in the locked house. He might be the most famous doubter of all time, but he wasn't going to miss this time. Like the week before, Jesus showed up. As a result, Thomas's world was shaken and he was transformed. Early church history tells us that Thomas becomes the first missionary to India, perhaps the farthest away of any of the disciples, and there gave his life for this risen Jesus whom he had doubted. Thomas was transformed by this amazing truth. Something astounding has happened. God raised Jesus from the dead. It's a real historical event that changes everything. Like Thomas that first week, we later Christians have not seen Jesus in the flesh as the disciples did on that Sunday night. We've not seen Jesus in physical form, and yet, around the world and throughout time, we later Christians have declared together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, the third day he was raised from the dead. Based on what we were told by those original apostles in Scripture, by the church, perhaps moved by historical arguments, we accept this statement is true, Jesus rose from the dead. And yet, we have to acknowledge that we haven't always given this truth the emphasis that it deserves. A couple of weeks ago, I happened to be listening to Christian radio, and an announcer on that station was making a pitch to any unbelievers who might be listening. His words were something like this, if your la life is lacking something, if you don't have the assurance of eternal life, you need to know that the life and death of Jesus Christ provided everything you need to find reconciliation with God. The life and death of Jesus Christ, there was no mention of the resurrection. I'm sure that that radio host believes in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, but his emphasis, like ours often, is on the life of and death of Jesus, not the resurrection. In the scriptures, however, we find that the apostles, led by Peter, presented the resurrection not just as the end of a story, but as the key to the gospel. In his sermon in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches these words, this Jesus God raised up, and of, all, and of that all of us are witnesses. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. You know, the resurrection should not be as surprising to us as it seems. God does not and never has delighted in death. He did not author death, and he will not allow death to reign. Listen to these words from the Wisdom of Solomon, written by a pious Jewish person about a hundred years before Jesus. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. For he created all things so that they might exist. The life-giving forces of the world are wholesome, and there is no destructive poison in them. And the dominion of the grave is not on earth, for righteousness is lives forever. God is the author of life. Jesus said that the very reason why he came to earth is that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. 
according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism of 1647, the destiny and duty of each of us is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The Apostle James says in his letter, every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. This good and generous God is the one from whom and from whose good hand all creation sprung forth, of whom it is said by the psalmist, you cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth, wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. Our God delights in life. He celebrates and nourishes life, and his goodness is seen everywhere around us. But since the time of Adam and Eve, sin and death have also been present in this world, contrary to God's desire. Therefore, Jesus had to conquer death on the cross. He's the king of life who has conquered death and will, in the end, completely destroy it. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, we read that Jesus is the one through whom all things came into being. Without him, not one thing lives that is living. He is the one, John says, in whom is life, and that life is the light of all people. That one who is the source of all life could not remain in the grave. He had to burst forth into life to emerge from the grave the victor, the conqueror of death. That Jesus rose from the dead should not surprise us. It would have been the greatest surprise of all if he had not. And yet, as much as we might have or should have expected the God of life to conquer death through the resurrection of Jesus, it still was incredibly shocking when it happened. After Jesus had been raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, he appeared to his followers in ways that totally surprised them. In Revelation chapter 1, the risen Jesus appears to John in glory with blinding light and a sword coming from his mouth. And John reports of that incident, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of the grave. What must have gone through John's mind when he saw Jesus in this exalted form with all the majesty of the eternal Son of God? I think he must have been tremendously humbled, taken aback, even embarrassed to think about how even in the writing of his gospel, he had, I think, kind of audaciously referred to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. How brash it was for him to suggest, along with his brother James, that Jesus might need them to call down fire from heaven to destroy people who had rejected Jesus. And how immature and arrogant they had been when they asked him, Jesus, when you come into your glory, can we sit at your right hand and your left hand? Confronted with the presence of the risen Christ, John was no longer arrogant or brash. Instead, he fell in humility and worship as though dead at the feet of the risen Jesus. Like all the disciples on Easter Sunday evening when Jesus appeared to them, like Thomas a week later, like Saul, later to be Paul, on the road to Damascus, John was filled with awe and fear in such a way that Jesus had to reach out and touch him gently and assure him that he, Jesus, comes with life, that he is the prince of life who rules over death. In word or in action, in sight or through faith, all who see the risen Jesus have the same reaction as Thomas, my Lord and my God. The truth that transforms all of human history is that God really, truly raised Jesus from the dead. 
This event has revoked the rule of sin and death and its power. And we can look forward to a time when they are completely destroyed, no longer working their ruin against us and their rebellion against God. But when I began this morning, I promised you not one but two transforming truths. Here is the second closely related truth. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, he is now alive and is with us with love and with power. It was, after all, the presence of Jesus that transformed Thomas from skeptic to confirmed follower. Thomas was confronted with the truth that Jesus had, in fact, been raised from the dead, that thing that he had so doubted when the disciples told him about it. At the same time, he was totally overwhelmed with this twin truth, Jesus is alive. And that being true, he now owed Jesus his entire life. He said, my Lord, which means my master, my king, my ruler, and my God. God raised Paul, as Paul says in Ephesians, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. In our own time, Timothy Keller said it this way, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. The resurrection changes everything. Jesus is king over death and king of life, but also the one who is king over my life. Christians who heard the story of Thomas in the Gospel of John or the words from Revelation 1 that John wrote we're in the late, probably last decade of the first century when John wrote them. They lived in a world where the Roman emperor Domitian claimed himself to be Lord and demanded that everyone who entered his presence recognize and acknowledge him as Lord and God. Christians who refused, including some of his own family, suffered imprisonment, exile, and death. Yet the Christians of his day subversively used his own words against him. Meeting each other on the street, early Christians would say, The Lord be with you. And the other would answer, And also with you. With a wink and a nod, they knew they were not offering worship to Domitian, the emperor. No human emperor could claim to be their Lord, but they were confessing, even in those simple words, their faith in Jesus of Nazareth, as the risen Lord, the master and king of all. Domitian might rule from Rome over a vast human empire, but the risen Jesus is present everywhere and is ruler of all. Not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. You know, these are not obscure philosophical, theological truths reserved for seminarians and theologians. They are for us. When Jesus reached out to Thomas, he reached beyond him, beyond his time of Thomas, to you and to me. For John tells us that Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Those words are references to you and to me, as without human physical sight, we have come to believe in Jesus as risen Lord. We are included among those who follow Jesus as Lord through faith, not by sight, trusting our lives to the one who gives life, the one who conquered sin and death on our behalf. The power of God's Spirit brought Jesus from the grave and Jesus gives this same eternal life through the Spirit to those of us who believe. That same Holy Spirit brings the very presence of Jesus into our hearts 
so that wherever we are, he is present with us and he is Lord over everything that we experience, over everything that we face. And this changes everything. As Charles Swindoll says in his reflection on the resurrection, the devil, darkness, and death may swagger and boast. The pangs of life will sting for a while longer. But don't worry. The forces of evil are breathing their last. Not to worry. He is risen. Two transforming truths. God gave us life and destroyed death when he raised Jesus from the dead. And secondly, because Jesus rose, he is Lord of all and with us always in power and in love. These twin truths are the message of Easter and need to always be in our hearts and on our lips. There's a Romanian Orthodox saying which proclaims, every day is Sunday and every Sunday is Resurrection Day. The resurrection impacts every day and everything in our lives. In this season of Lent and Easter, but also beyond it, through every day of our life, through every year, we need to listen and learn from those Orthodox brothers and sisters who persistently emphasize the importance of Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And this makes all the difference. For the risen Jesus is alive today and is ruler of all. One of the things that I love about this place is that weekly reminder as we leave when we say together, Jesus is Lord. Let these words be your liturgy, not just for ending a church service, but for living every moment and every day. Because Jesus arose from the dead, he defeated death and is alive and with us right now in almighty power and unending love with our Orthodox Christian friends, with Christians throughout every place and through all times, let us see that every day is a Sunday and every Sunday is Resurrection Day. And because of this, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Our merciful God, who delights to stoop to our level to speak to us through your word, Grant us all grace that we may not be mere hearers of your word, but doers also. Give us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may believe what has been promised to us. May we bring glory and honor to your name in all that we do as you conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. May his victory over death bring your life to our hearts and to the world in which we live. And may our thoughts, words, and actions Mark us as people who acknowledge Jesus as ruler of all. Amen.